say uh, last service I took Anthony on a wild goose chase in the slides, <laughs> and he, he like. He hung in there with me. He didn't. He didn't leave after the service. So thank you, Anthony. You were scared a little. You did. We didn't feel it. You you covered it for it perfectly. Um, as we get started today, also let me remind you that the chili cook-off is today. You might have seen a little light banter on the uh, social media outlets this week. Um, I, if y'all would have been here at nine o'clock, you would have been able to smell victory because my chili was brewing out in the welcome center. Um, but. I hear we have some other contestants from here in, in the audience. Jake, you, you're entering some. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. We're representing Greenwood here. And Molly, she's our communications person. Um, you're able to edit these videos that get streamed and take out certain parts, right? Or you could, like, bleep over a piece of it. Because here's the deal, y'all. I don't care who wins. I don't need to win. I just need Adam Scherz not to, okay? <laughs> so take that out, Molly. You got it? Uh, so show up. Support the guests today. Um, they're doing amazing ministry across the country in Stockton, California. If you uh, go and visit our Facebook page, um, there's a picture I posted yesterday of uh, a group of about 15 kids standing up and they're holding their bilingual Jesus storybook Bibles. And you know why they have those? Because you all donated them and you wrote them little notes inside and they're going to have those um, as they move forward in their lives. And so we um, are partnering with the guests in the ways that we know how through our prayers, um, through going on short-term mission trips with them, sending things that they need. But today is another great way to do that, um, to go and just eat some great chili, vote for any of them but Adams, and, uh, and, uh, and enjoy one another. So y'all don't go back and report that. We got some Melrose folks with us today. Don't tell him, Sneeds, all right? I love y'all. Y'all know how much I love you. All right. The past few weeks, we have been on a journey. We have been kind of retracing tracing the steps of Jesus throughout his life. We've been going to the places where he went. As Carla mentioned, she and I had the chance to go to Israel this past uh, month. And so uh, we're sharing with you some of what we learned about the actual setting of where Jesus was in the hopes of breathing some fresh new life into these stories that, that many of us have really heard our entire lives. Today we get to go to one of the places that I think was nearest and dearest to Jesus' heart. It was the place that became like his second home, um, a place that when he talked about it, I'm pretty sure like his face just like kind of lit up as he started telling them about it. And so that got me to thinking, you know, we all come from somewhere. We all have a hometown. Some of us might be from here in Bowling Green, but many of us are transplants like me. And so we're going to take just a second. I want you to turn and talk to someone that you did not ride the church with today. <laughs> tell them where your hometown is. And if it's here, that's fine. And tell them something you Unique, something great about the place where you're from. Go. <clears throat> where are you from? From here too? All right. Is there anything I don't know about Bowling Green that's unique? I'm from Powderly, Kentucky, Muhlenberg, Muhlenberg County, Powderly. Yeah, yeah. Not too far. That's right. That's a step up. It's a step up. to come eat chili. You can talk more about your hometowns. But somebody tell me, tell me, tell me where your hometown is and something special about it. All right, Chelsea. Um, I'm from Columbus, Georgia. All right. And the cool thing about it is the, um, there's a lot of things. Um, the last battle of the Civil War was fought there. There you Thankfully go. After it was News traveled more slowly right. then, yeah. And the original Coca-Cola recipe. There? Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Noted. All right. Columbus, Georgia. All right. Kathy. Um, I'm from Columbus, Georgia, and I'm from Columbus, Georgia. 
originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yes. That's right. That's right. They've got the Steelers. Beth. I'm from Churchville, Maryland, and we are home of a world famous family of Shakespearean actors, one of whom was uh, the world's best Hamlet. On record as the world's best Hamlet. His last name is Booth, and you might know his brother better. John oh. <laughs> yes, yes. I see. Some of us have things we're famous for, and others of us have things we're infamous for. But, uh, yeah. There you go. I like it. Way to lift up that, that redemption story in that family. I like that. <laughs> Somebody else? Best wings? Is there a certain restaurant? Madison Garden. Madison Garden? Yeah, Dry Rub. Dry Rub. <laughs> So you're going to go and get us some next Saturday and bring them back. We'll eat them on Sunday together. Okay. Well, you all um, are, are familiar with where I'm from. I talk about it quite a bit. Um, I am from Powderly, Kentucky in Muhlenberg County. And believe it or not, we do have a few things to celebrate. Right, Mom and Dad? First of all, what? That's right. I didn't put that on the list, but that is a good one. No stoplights, right? Um, it is the birthplace of James Best, who you might recognize as Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane on Dukes of Hazard. Um, we also are home to Uncle Lee's, which is an outdoorsman store. People used to come for miles around. I think it's a, a glimmer of its former glory, but it's still there, still going. Uh, we have this amazing rails to trail program. This actually starts in Greenville goes through Powderly and gets to Central City um, and if you make it all the way through the trail there's this place where you can get gigantic milkshakes you know like the one that has a and huge pizza the milkshakes that have like the slice of cheesecake on the side of it right so it's pretty awesome we like that and then uh, Powderly Donuts the best donuts for miles around so I love to go home. It's a special place. If you ever go through Powderly, please don't blink or you will miss it. Um, now, Jesus' hometown, where was it? Nazareth. You are so good. Both services have been on it. I just knew somebody would yell at Bethlehem, and we'd have to remember, you know, like they had to make the journey there when he was born. They were, he's actually from Nazareth. Um, that was where Mary and Joseph were from. Um, he grew up there, but you might remember the story that once he started his public ministry, he kind of had to get out of town pretty fast, right? Um, he went into the synagogue one day. Oh, Joseph's son, he sits down, which means that as a rabbi, he sits down, means he starts to teach. He unrolls the scroll. He reads this passage from Isaiah and rolls it back up. And he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing, which kind of made people go, huh? Like, don't we know this guy? They're already a little bit on edge. And then he goes on and he starts to talk about how God's like including Gentiles in this new thing he's going to be doing in the world and his kingdom. And People were so upset, they literally ran him out of town and almost off a cliff. I have now seen the cliff, you guys, and um, if he would have gotten pushed off, it would not have gone well for him. All right, it's a big cliff. You can see it overlooking there. I think we got one other shot of the side of it. So, needless to say, after this happened in Nazareth, Jesus needed to move on. He needed to find a new place to call home. And so what he did is he took off northeast on uh, the Roman road that went through or by Nazareth. Um, and he, he went northeast up toward the Sea of Galilee. It was in that area where he would live throughout most of his ministry. And uh, the sea itself was definitely like the crown jewel, the thing that anyone from there was quick to tell everyone about. Because, I mean, just look at it. It's kind of gorgeous, right? Um, back in the first century, it would have been this bustling um, fisherman kind of place where, you know, there's fishing boats all over the place. Um, and there was no less than 27 
seven different harbors on this little lake. Um, here's a monument that has um, kind of the shape where you can see the lake. It's about 13 miles north to south and seven across. And so when you're there on the lake, you can very easily see across it. Um, you can't maybe north to south see the end of it, but definitely across it. And it's very easy to just like hop in a boat and go from place to place to place very quickly and very easily. Um, now, Jesus, um, in his ministry as he was serving there, one of the interesting things about this area is around that lake, there were all kinds of different settlements. There was like a Roman settlement, and then there was a Jewish settlement, and then there were Greek cities that still existed there. And so it was as if like all the people of the world had gathered there around that lake. And so that's where Jesus was headed. He got on that Roman road. It was the Via Maris, um, where lots of trade happened. He started going in that direction. And the very first place he would have come to there at the Sea of Galilee was a place called Magdala. If Magdala sounds familiar, it's because you've probably heard of Mary Magdalene, right? Um, Mary Magdalene was from this place. Um, there in Magdala, they have this beautiful uh, mosaic that depicts her encounter with Jesus. You can kind of see in the background a crack, which represents the brokenness that she's experienced in her life. And then her and Jesus encountering one another. You can see kind of like the flower coming up there, which is the blooming of hope in her life. You can see um, seven demons that are coming out of her in this moment, in the midst of this encounter. We're not told how exactly those demons afflicted her, only that she had them. Um, and uh, one thing I do want to note, though, is that whenever we hear about her a lot, you'll hear her described as being a prostitute. However, if you go back to your Bible and you read it carefully, you will never find her called that there, okay? I just want to clear that up. Um, you might wonder, like, where did that come from? It kind of has been passed on through uh, the tradition of the church. It kind of makes me wonder um, the fact that she showed up in so many places in the story of Jesus. She and, and other women like her um, traveled around with Jesus. They helped support his ministry, fund his ministry, um, and that would have been a bit scandalous. People probably would have talked about that. Um, here she was showing up. Up, like at the cross and the tomb where all the other disciples had run and hid. They were afraid. Um, she uh, is the first person to proclaim the good news of, of the resurrection to be a witness. And so you kind of have to wonder if maybe she had this name attached to her as a way of maybe downplaying her significance, a way of putting her in her place. But nevertheless, um, she grew up in and lived in this place called Magdala, which in the first century would have been um, a city where a lot was happening. There was um, a harbor there. There was a wharf. Um, there would have been all kinds of different shops that existed. It was a marketplace where a lot of uh, fish were sold. Um, and... Um, and beyond that, it had things like a ritual baths where you could come and prepare for worship. And it has this, this system, water system, from the first century that's, or before that still works today. It'll still fill up with living water from the springs that are up in the hills. Magdala is a bit... Um, is a bit unique because in lots of places where you, you go in the Holy Land, it's like other things have been built on top of the original site. So you don't get to like see the place. You just know you're near the place. So you might see some remnants of it. But in Magdala, for whatever reason, this area went untouched for a long time. Like whenever the Romans came and um, kind of destroyed the city and actually kind of killed everyone there. It's a sad story. Um, like it just, it just was kind of like covered up over time and no one ever really developed it there. And so in 2008, someone decided they wanted to build a resort in this place and they start to dig and they don't have to go very da far down until they find this city preserved beneath it. And one of the most spectacular things that they found was a synagogue. A synagogue that would have existed in the first century. So again, here's Jesus coming in on the Via Maris, coming through Magdala. It's very likely that Jesus stood in this place and taught himself. You can see on the walls um, as you enter the synagogue, like some of the frescoes are still able to be seen. You can see the mosaic of the floor being preserved. And then the box kind of thing you see sitting in the, the center is um, called the Magdala Stone. And it has um, the earliest 
kind of drawings of the second temple that, that we know of, that are in existence. And so it was this spectacular find whenever they encounter Magdala. But again, um, it's just pretty remarkable to think about Jesus coming from Nazareth into Magdala and having walked through these shops and these places and perhaps stood there in the synagogue. As he continued on his journey, kind of north and east around the Sea of Galilee, the next place that he would have come to was the place where he would one day sit down and deliver his Sermon on the Mount. I don't know about you, but whenever I I thought about that scene, I never thought about the sea being in view. But indeed it was. He would have sat down on this hill. The water and the hill together would form this natural amphitheater where people would be able to hear him for miles around. And now in that spot sits a church um, that has eight sides um, to uh, stand for the eight Beatitudes that he delivered in that place. The eight Beatitudes that describe heaven coming on earth, what that looks like when that happens in us and among us. And inside they, um, they have depicted this collision between heaven and earth in this beautiful way with the ceiling being gold depicting heaven and natural stone on the floor depicting earth. From that place, Jesus would have continued traveling on around the Sea of Galilee. And there he would have gone through the place where he would eventually um, take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 men plus men, uh, women and children on top of that. Um, this miraculous feeding of people that, that took place as he took a sack lunch and then made this huge feast. In that place, there stands a chapel today. And uh, when you go inside, um, you can see uh, the rock uh, kind of protruding from the floor there at the bottom. And that's believed to be the rock where he performed this miracle. And when you look at it closer up, you see the rock there again. And then in front of it, it's a very famous mosaic and in that mosaic you can clearly see the two fish from the miracle and then you see a basket and if you start to count the loaves you'll only count four there (laughs) because um, the artist um, made it in such a way that on the altar there would normally be the loaf that you would share in for communion so it's as if um, that's all a part of the story and a continuation of the miracle that Jesus performed there that day Um, As Jesus continued on, he would have kept going northeast around the Sea of Galilee. And the next place that he would have come to was the place where he would one day appear to his disciples after his resurrection. And in this place, you might remember the story. um, They've been out fishing all night. Where are my fishermen? Anybody here like to fish? No one want to admit it? Okay, a few of you. Have you ever had the day where just like nothing was biting? You caught nothing at all? And maybe like somebody came along and was like, hey, why don't you try this? And you're probably like, yeah, yeah. Like I've done that a million times. <laughs> well, that seems to be what happened. They've been out fishing all night. They've caught nothing at all. And here's Jesus being kind of like the armchair fisherman, you know, telling them like, put your net out one more time. And they do so probably reluctantly. But whenever they do, they pull in this haul of fish they can't even get into the boat because it's so many fish. In fact, it tells us a number. It says that there are 123, am I missing that up? 123 fish, 53 fish, 153 fish they pull into the shore. And so we can read that number and we can think, you know what? Maybe that's a uh, 153 fish, right? Like a fisherman's tail. Or um, our guide gave us a different perspective. She said that the 153 fish in the net uh, meant this, that the net uh, symbolized unity. And that the 153 fish symbolized the 153 nations that were kind of gathered there all around the Sea of Galilee. And it was a picture of what Jesus was doing, uniting all people in and through him. In this really beautiful way, just from that one story, it's a way of helping us remember that whenever Jesus went from Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee, he wasn't just going from one Jewish settlement to another one, but rather in a very real way, what Jesus was doing was going from his hometown to the nations. 
inside the church there, you can see the rock where Jesus would have sat down with his disciples and shared a meal once they hauled all those fish in. And then outside of the church, you can see a statue where Jesus restored Peter because you might remember Peter denied him the three times. But after they share this meal, Jesus restores him, asking him uh, three times if he loves him and asking him in return each time Peter says yes to feed his sheep. From this place, as Jesus continued northeast, the next place he would arrive at would be the place that he would come to call his second home. It's a place called Capernaum. And today, as you enter into Capernaum, you'll find this statue that's uh, sitting there, um, a statue of Jesus experiencing homelessness, because in a very real way, as Jesus said himself, uh, foxes have dens and birds have trees, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He depended on the hospitality of others to give him a place to call home. And very likely it was Peter who opened his home to Jesus. Um, We have that home preserved there. You can see it here. Um, And it's very hard to see. And if you get close or if you want me to show you the picture here in a little bit, there's this little white, white and black speck that's on top of the inner wall. And that is a cat that had made its home there in Peter's house while I was there. It was not budging. Um, Uh, But uh, this is the outline of what remains of Peter's home. Over the top of it is built a church. Um, This is the place where it is believed that um, Jesus likely stayed and called home after he left Nazareth. It's the place where Jesus would have healed um, Peter's mother-in-law, the place where the crowds would have gathered around and Jesus healed them all night. And likely the place, scholars believe, where um, the friends brought their friend who was paralyzed and opened the hole in the roof and lowered him down. So a lot happens here, and this is, again, the church over it. And on the walls, you can see in the woodwork all of the the different miracles believed to be performed there on the walls. And then the center, that's glass, where you can, like, look down into the home. And so, again, all these towns, it's just like the greatest hits of Jesus as you're going along, right? And that's only a few of the places that would have been there around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus went. But... This is where a whole, whole lot of his ministry took place. But at the center of it all was the the star of the show, the sea itself. And I just want you to take a moment to take in the sea that's there, to hear its waves. I mean... Can you blame Jesus for wanting to stay around here, right? It's beautiful. It can be so calm. This water, again, like brought people from all over the world together in this spot. It was also a good distance from Jerusalem, and so that kept Jesus out of trouble a little bit. He was further away from the religious teachers and leaders. They had to make a journey to come see him there. So in those ways, it was kind of strategic. But again, like, it's gorgeous. So why not go and stay there? Uh, But um, let's think back to our hometowns, right? Like we named the great parts of our hometowns. But every hometown, it has its great parts and the not so great parts, doesn't it? And so, you know, what I didn't tell you all earlier is like all those things I named about Powderly, that's it. That's all we got. All right. Like there's nothing else. That was a complete exhaustive list of what you can do while you were there. Unless you want to go to what we lovingly call the Powderly Country Club, which is the pool in my parents' backyard. You're all invited there. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, um, the same thing is true with, the, with Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee. As beautiful as that sea is, the problem was that that same road that Jesus came in on, the Via Maris, it was in this valley. And weather would come through that valley and it would hit that lower elevation where the lake was. And the weather would just kind of get trapped. And so it caused the wind and the waves to just kind of stay there and make a big mess out of everything. You know how like here in Bowling Green, we talk about the Bowling Green bubble and the weather goes around us, right? Um, It was the opposite there. It would get in and it'd get trapped. And so as much as Jesus and his his disciples were out on the the sea going from here to there, it was inevitable that they would not only experience the beauty, but also a few of the storms that popped up on the lake. 
This picture here depicts one of those storms that they encountered. This is another one of those mosaics out of uh, Magdala. Um, there, there are these curved mosaics that it feels like you're stepping into the story when when you enter the room. Um, I had to settle for a flat version, but it's, um, it's beautiful nonetheless. Um, I can remember being a kid and sitting crisscross applesauce on the floor of my Sunday school class. Maybe you can remember this too. And then pulling out the flannel board. Anybody like the flannel board? Yeah, pulling it out. And my teacher's putting up the, the, this story. And I'm getting to this high climatic moment where Jesus is walking out on the waves that are crashing all around him. And Peter having this courage to get out and start walking toward him as well. Until that is, you know, he got afraid and he began to sink. And my, my teachers would always use this as an opportunity to talk to us about the importance of not just having faith, but keeping faith. They would use this as this opportunity to talk to us about, about focusing our eyes on Jesus and not being swayed. But every time that they would tell this story, they would tell it from the book of Matthew. But I don't know if you noticed when Courtney read this earlier, it's a, a very different story in the gospel of Mark. There's some significant differences that are there. For, for starters, this high climatic moment where Peter gets out and walks on the waves, it's not there. It's missing. And so that's interesting, right? Something to notice. It's not there. But what is even more interesting to me are the details that Mark does decide to put into the story. Because I'll be, I'll be really honest with you all. They are details that I wish that Mark would have left out. They make me uncomfortable. They make me uneasy. They make me feel like I'm on those waves. Because they make me wrestle a little bit whenever I read them. So we're going to look at those t the, that today. We're going to look at Mark's account of this exchange. Um, in both Matthew and Mark... They start in the same place. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. He's just done this miraculous thing. And he decides that he's going to send his disciples ahead of him. He's like, you all get in the boat. You go on to the next place. It should have been a very short journey. It shouldn't have taken them very long to get there at all on the sea. Um, and then what Jesus does is he stays behind. He sends all the other people away. And he goes up on a mountain to pray. Where are my introverts at in this room? All right, you all get this, right? Jesus has peopled all day long. He's had these crowds around him, and he loves people, but him and God are just going to need a minute, all right? So they can be charged up and do this again. He goes up on the mountain. He is praying. And yet again, um, we have Mark and Matthew agreeing. They agree that there are waves and wind and waves that happen on the sea that night. But there is this distinct difference in how they talk about the wind. In Matthew's gospel, he says that the wind on the sea, that, that the boat was buffeted by the wind and waves. The boat, an object, a thing, that is what the wind is against. But listen to how Mark describes it. He says that Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. That is way more personal, isn't it? I mean, in Mark's account, it is Jesus' friends, Jesus' companions, Jesus' partners in ministry that the wind and waves are against. They are struggling and they are straining. And, and neither gospel tells us exactly how long, but it is clear in both of them that there is this period of time in which Jesus notices this and he actually responds. We're told that it's like almost morning, the fourth watch of the night, long after the disciples should have already reached their destination, that Jesus finally goes out on the sea. And so for this period of time, we have Jesus sitting up on the mountain by himself, watching his friends struggle and strain. I'll be honest, I don't know what to do with that, y'all. I don't know how to feel about that. But at times, it's kind of felt that way to me in my own life. It's kind of felt like there's been these moments where, where I am struggling and straining and thrashing about in the waves and Jesus feels far away. 
But it, again, it kind of like creates this tension. Like, is that really what Jesus does? You know, I want Mark to relieve this tension for me right away. And so as we continue to read on, that's what we hope happens, that Mark makes this all all right. But listen instead to what he says next. He says, shortly before dawn, he went out to them, which that's good, right? Like Jesus is going to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. Hear that again, pass by them. In other translations, it says he intended to pass them by. He meant to pass them by. Wait a second here, right? Like we thought that Jesus was finally about to help his friends, that he was finally about to rescue them from the wind and waves. But is he just waltzing over to the other side of the lake? Again, like, how are we supposed to feel with it, about this? It, it doesn't sit well. It doesn't mesh with the Jesus who we know and we love and who cares about us. And so as I was studying this a while back, I just kept thinking to myself, like, surely, surely I am missing something here. And so as I was wrestling with it over and over, replaying those words, pass by, pass by, pass by. That's when I finally started to hear an echo that I'd originally missed. It's an echo from the larger story of God that's ringing forth in Mark's gospel, an echo of, of the Old Testament. Jesus, God in human flesh, is about to, he intends to, he meant to pass the disciples by. Just like God himself had passed by Moses to show him his glory and goodness. Jesus, God in human flesh, he is about to, he intended to, he meant to pass by his disciples. Just as God himself had passed by Elijah at the opening of the cave and spoke to him in a gentle whisper. In both of those cases in the Old Testament, God was encouraging these people at these key critical moments when they really needed it, when they were facing difficult things. And he passes them by to give them strength to face whatever lies before them. He passes them by to remind them that they're not alone in this or any moment. And now here in the book of Mark, Jesus passes by the disciples. He passes them by to do the same thing, to encourage and strengthen them. Yes, in the midst of this struggle that they're, they're in, um, in the midst of, in, in the middle of this lake. But also he passes them by to encourage them in the midst of, of their ministry that they're walking alongside Jesus in and to prepare them, to strengthen them for what lay, lays ahead, his death. Of course, initially, the disciples, they're terrified when they see him. They think that he's a ghost. But Jesus, he calls out to them with yet another echo from the Old Testament. He says to them, take courage. It is I. It is I literally translated. It means I am. It is the name that God himself gave to Moses when Moses asked who he was. And then Mark concludes the story by saying this. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. It seems that despite the fact that these disciples have been walking around with Jesus all over the Sea of Galilee area, right? Despite the fact that they're serving and ministering with him, despite the fact that they watched him work all these miracles, including taking a sack lunch and feeding 5,000 people with it just hours before that, that they have still not fully realized who he is or what he is capable of. They haven't realized that he is Emmanuel, God with them. Their hearts were hard. But as Jesus walks up on the water, he does the very thing that Job says that only God can do. This is Job chapter 9 verse 8. He says, he, God, alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Jesus passes by them to soften their hearts and to open their eyes to his true identity that he was and he is the great I am, God himself. 
As Jesus ministered in and around his new hometown of uh, there around the Sea of Galilee, he was doing this all over the place, all the time. He was passing people by, literally and figuratively, to do this very same thing, to encourage them in the midst of the struggles that they were facing, reminding them that God was with them. And perhaps today you need reminding of that as well. Maybe you find yourself in the midst of a difficult season and the wind and the waves are crashing against you and you feel overwhelmed about what lies ahead. Perhaps you've lost sight of Jesus' divine power and you've kind of forgotten who he is and what he can do in and through your life and our world. Maybe your heart has become hard. But my prayer today is that as we continue to worship together, is that Jesus will pass you by in a very meaningful and moving way. That you would experience the reality once again of who he is and find yourself encouraged and strengthened for what lies ahead. I'm going to lead us in a a time of prayer um, that I hope guides us to have that kind of encounter. You all know I like to pray with my hands, and maybe it's because I'm a little bit ADD and it keeps me focused, but if it helps me, it might help you all too. And so if you're willing, I'd like to invite you to um, take your hands and turn them palms up to the ceiling. You can put them in your lap and you can close your eyes. And I'm going to guide you through a little time of prayer with God today. Lord God, we come before you, perhaps feeling like you are distant, like you're up on the mountain watching us thrash about, that you're indifferent, that you don't care. Maybe that's how we feel. But God, what we know as a fact is that you do care and that you are near. And so God, we pray in these next moments that you would help us to feel that that you would encourage us in the midst of our struggles and remind us of your presence. So with your palms up in this moment, I'd like you to just kind of imagine sitting there in your hands, the storms that you're facing. What are you struggling and straining against? Where is it that you need encouragement today? And now, having felt the weight of those struggles in your life today, let me invite you to turn your palms down now toward the floor, releasing those struggles to God and taking just a moment to tell them, tell him about it, taking just a moment to invite him in. And now, if you're willing, turn your palms back up toward the ceiling and prepare for God to pass you by. In just a moment, you're going to hear the sound of the waves of the Sea of Galilee once more. And as you hear them, may they be a reminder that God's grace is flowing into your life today. And that it's flowing into the places where you need his grace the very most in this moment. Receive strength today. Receive strength from the one who is the great I am and who can walk upon the waves. Encourage us and strengthen us. Help us to keep moving forward, knowing that we're not alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.